Welcome to ThoughtCast, the Hindu's podcast and video series linked to our opinion pages. In this series, we will bring you analytical debates and look at critical questions in the realm of politics, economics, society, law, climate change, and much more. I'm Narayan Lakshman, Senior Associate Editor at The Hindu and Opinion Editor of the newspaper. And I will be discussing with a number of expert guests over many episodes to come these issues and bring you the latest debates. I'm pleased to have with me for the fourth episode of ThoughtCast, Professor Sonalde Desai. Professor Desai is a demographer and she works with the India Human Development Survey. She also holds an appointment with the National Council of Applied Economic Research and heads up as director, the National Data Innovation Center. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Desai. In this episode, we'll be looking at several key questions coming out of the PMEAC, or the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council report, which came out recently taking a closer look at population. In particular, we'll be looking at how the report comments on the specific population growth rates within certain religious communities. We will also be looking at the overall context of the report in terms of where does India's population growth and trajectory stand after these many decades since independence? Or what should the government be doing to impact policy in terms of how it affects the population growth of India? Should it be impacting it at all? Or is there a natural pathway for population development in the country? Finally, we'll be looking at India's population policy in terms of should it be attempting to impact the rate of growth and the pattern of development of the population itself? And should the government be tracking individual religions or religious communities' population growth? So thank you for coming, uh, Professor Desai. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you for the invitation. Great. So uh, today we'll be looking at the uh, Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council report that looked at population uh, and specifically at the rate of growth of the population over multiple decades and linked it to specific growth rates within certain religious communities. And in the context of the ongoing election, obviously, it has caused a little bit of a furor because you've seen the rate, growth rate for some communities go down, some of them go down even further. But it also has begged some analytical questions about can you link population growth to social economic status? So, for example, one of the arguments mentioned uh, the, in the commentaries that came after the report was released was that, look, the growth rate of the Muslim population has come down significantly, uh, uh, but the rate, growth rate of the Hindu population has also dropped. So in one sense, the fact that maybe the rate of growth of the Muslim population could have come down even more, uh, some politicians use that to say, look, the fact that the population is thriving suggests that they are doing well in terms of socioeconomic status. But others point out that when you have a higher socioeconomic status, for example, more education, maybe more access to contraception and family planning, it is then that the, the rate of uh, growth of the population comes down. So can you tell us a bit more about what this report actually does say in the context of these comments? And then we can get into more details from there. You know, the report has a very curious sentence that I'm going to read out. It says, we are agnostic to the underlying causes of such demographic change and simply focus on the share of minority population as a cumulative measure of their well-being. This action is a very curious statement because virtually no population expert has ever claimed that. Uh, in fact, if you look at the state-specific share of Indian population, the share of Bihar went up from 9 to 12 percent. Uh, between 1951 and uh, 2011, uh, the share of Gujarat remained more or less steady, 4.5% uh, to 5%. Right? Right. Now, none of us would say that Bihar is doing much better socioeconomically than Gujarat is. Right? Yes. Yes. So in some sense, it's somewhat of a disingenuous statement. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, what population research has shown is that the population growth rate goes down or people have fewer children when they're doing well. Right. Uh, when you can expect that infant mortality rate is low and the children you have will survive, people start having fewer children. 
when they start realizing that they can educate their children and these children will have good jobs okay mm -hmm. uh, they start moving from having more children to having fewer children and investing in them okay? so the idea that um, increasing minority population is a measure of their well being is actually somewhat uh, curious and not something that most demographers would agree with mm -hmm. okay uh, and then however they go on to say that uh, you know it is for example they take the example of pakistan and bangladesh and they talk about mm -hmm. how you underline what are called demographic shocks where you know that can reduce the proportion of the largest minorities in those countries which are actually in, in those countries they are hindus so they sort of have do provide an explanation in these contexts of these neighboring countries where they say because of this particular shock a certain other communities numbers have come down here too are they getting into actual causality does do they talk about specific socio economic factors or demographic factors that have impacted each community i don't think they do um it, it, there are a lot of historical factors which sort of lead to change in population growth rate in different areas mm -hmm. uh depending upon both migration uh as well as education opportunities and so on so i think it makes more sense for us to focus on india rather than to undertake some of these comparisons mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, india provides a very interesting example of what is going on Mm -hmm. uh in terms of our fertility rate okay, which is that on the whole uh, fertility in india has been falling pretty steadily okay, okay. Uh, to a level that we are at a replacement level fertility mm -hmm. it has fallen for every socio economic group okay? okay it's fallen for hindus it has fallen for dalits uh, it's for, uh, fallen for scheduled tribes and it has fallen for muslims mm -hmm. so basically i think what we are seeing is that india has full fledged into demographic transition where larger families have become liabilities people's aspirations have increased and everyone has begun to have fewer children right whether it's hindu or muslim or anybody else okay uh but again if you go down to the sort of religious or community level i think what mm -hmm. has got a lot of the political commentary going after this report is that uh, the share of hindus as a proportion of india's population declined between 1950 and 2015 uh, from 84.68% to 78% but as the muslim pro uh, population proportion has risen from 9.84% to 14% over the same period um i guess what i'm trying to get at is how much do does this in fact reflect social economic status does it in fact reflect policies maybe in terms of the you know the population related policy planning does it reflect the impact of those things or uh, is it just in terms of overall fertility you know it has a certain momentum like you talked about at the national level it's been going down uh, how do you explain the variations historically muslims have had slightly higher fertility then hindus uh, pretty much um, over all the years of our independence okay? Okay. a lot of it is associated with the fact that the muslim population a lives uh, uh, is disproportionately concentrated in north india where there is a higher fertility mm -hmm. it's also associated with the fact that they have had lower education and muslims have steadily fallen behind mm -hmm. uh, in their educational attainment compared to the hindus so all of these get reflected in a slightly higher fertility rate of the mm -hmm. muslim population mm -hmm. but it's very interesting that in spite of this slightly higher fertility uh, rate of muslims the muslim decline has been actually larger than the hindu decline so mm -hmm. for example between 1992 and 2021 nfhs survey 1 versus 5 uh, hindu tfr total fertility rate fell from 3.3 to 1.9 mm -hmm. which is a drop of about 1.4 children mm -hmm. okay? whereas muslim total fertility rate fell from 4.4 to 2.4 which is a drop of two children okay? right uh, muslim women had about 1.1 child more in 1992 uh, than hindu women and the difference dropped to uh, about half a child in 2021 okay. so i think the report is correct in pointing out that there has been a slightly higher fertility among the muslim population 
-hmm. It is also correct to point out that this gap has been declining. And in fact, the decline in Muslim fertility has been greater than decline in the Hindu fertility. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And I think one other thing you mentioned earlier, which was interesting when you talked about Bihar and so on, is the regional variation. Uh, what can you say about that? Does that? What is that in terms of policy thinking that we should conclude in terms of how India's population growth has varied across the country itself in different regions? You know, it, it's funny. At one point in time, we used to think when we were very concerned about population bomb and high fat of population growth rate, okay? we used to worry that these are the laggard states which are not performing well, they are not doing well. That's mm -hmm. when we also worried that there were some, some groups or populations that were kind of laggard. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Interestingly, as our fertility has started declining, okay? mm -hmm. and we are now at a pretty much of a replacement level, okay? yeah. we need to start worrying about both population stabilization not just uh, worrying about the high population growth rate, but also making sure that uh, our we don't face the kind of demographic cliff that China does. Mm -hmm. China did very well initially in controlling its population through its one-child policy. Okay? Yeah. But now they have a large number of elderly compared mm -hmm. to very small, uh, relatively fewer working age population to support that elderly. Correct. And in fact, Chinese government is trying very hard to increase the fertility. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and once you have kind of gone into this cycle of a low fertility, it's very difficult to bring it back. Okay. So I actually think that India should be quite pleased with the fact that our fertility decline has been somewhat slower mm -hmm. and that we have had a variation across different states mm -hmm. so that we will have a pool of working age population uh, at one point in time, we worried about North India as a burden on the rest of the country, uh, having a large number of young children. And mm. perhaps we'll start thinking about North India as a boon to the rest of the country uh, by having a large number of workers. So right. in some sense, the story seems to be flipping as we go ahead and progress on the demographic transition. Okay, okay. So that's really interesting because I think you, there you've kind of taken a step back and looked at India's sort of broad position in the longer arc and over time of how its population has behaved is, do you feel that uh, we are now at it sort of almost a tipping point? You mentioned the Chinese example where we're going from that demographic dividend view and, uh, you know, potential uh, as an economy and as a country that we have into maybe, you know, we're talking a few decades from now, tipping more towards having a greater elderly uh, proportion of the population is that is the demographic dividend story running a bit thin is it running out are we running out of time in that regard or do we have a long runway where we have a, this you know younger population that can support uh, the economy as a nation we are pretty much in squarely in the in the demographic dividend phase okay. and it will only last for a couple of decades hmm. interestingly though some of the states which had fertility decline at a lower, at a later time, okay, mm -hmm. are moving into the demographic dividend phase. Right. So while South India might be running out of steam, uh, North India might become the engine of economic growth from the population perspective. Right. And I think this is a story worth remembering. Right? Mm -hmm. There are a few things that I'd actually like to take opportunity to point out at this point. Okay? Mm -hmm that we have historically thought that somehow we need to manage our population growth. Okay? And yet, if you think about it, um, Judith Blake, a very well-known American demographer, once said, you know, people don't have birth rates, people have children. Okay? Right. Right. And I don't really think that controlling population through any population policy is has ever been particularly effective in a demographic mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. uh, what we do see, though, is that there is this, there are sort of natural changes that are taking place in mm -hmm. our population. And what we need to think about is how do we manage it and how do we make best use of it? Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we have a larger number of working age population coming from North India, okay, mm -hmm. maybe it is time for us to disproportionately invest in education system mm -hmm. uh, in uh, UP, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan to ensure Mm -hmm. the next generation of workers will be highly educated. Right, right. And right. I think that basically, I mean, we are one nation. Okay? Yeah. And we need to figure out how we make the best use of uh, the human resources that 
come from India. And I would say the same applies to the Muslim population. Right? Mm -hmm. um, what we need to figure out is how to make best use of Muslim young people who are yeah. going to be contributing to next generation of workers, mm -hmm. uh, ensure that they have education, skills, or employment opportunities. Right. Uh, differentiating between different groups, different states doesn't do us a whole lot of good. So uh, just to kind of uh, tie up the arguments there, do you think, can you give us based maybe on examples that you've studied of how other countries have proceeded in terms of population policy uh, or in terms of, you know, socio broader socioeconomic policy, like you said, providing the young people with the necessary human capital resources to actually be productive. What have other countries done that maybe India can learn from or is it India already doing which we need to keep that demographic dividend going for much longer to adjust, you know, uh, interreligious and interregional imbalances. You know, historically, I think that very few countries have succeeded in a population policy that is designed to manage fertility, mm -hmm. unless it's a coercive policy. Neither in reducing fertility nor in increasing fertility, there mm -hmm. has been any success. Okay. okay? Um, where the countries can succeed okay, is in ensuring that we create both um, high level of human capital in our children and uh, ensure education system that is effective. And the second thing we can work at would be to ensure that our employment structures are such that they are open and welcoming and they provide opportunities to everyone. It is, it is, you know, and, and of course, every politician, every government wants to create jobs. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. And job creation remains on the forefront of policy agenda, regardless of which government is in power. Okay? Mm -hmm. But I think that reducing barriers to employment uh, for and employment discrimination is also very important mm -hmm. to make sure that we have uh, a job market which is open to everyone. You know, I think that anti uh, Bihari sentiment in South doesn't help. Yes. Okay? yes. And uh, 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 reservation policies which um, uh, get structured in such a way that they are used by certain groups and not by others doesn't help. Mm -hmm. So I think what we need are employment and job opportunities where there are no barriers, Understood. where everyone has an equal opportunity. Of course, we need economic growth that creates more of those jobs. So mm. increasing the size of the pie yeah. and making sure that there are no barriers is very important. Okay, thank you so much. I think, you know, we've got some very useful insights from there. I, the most important you just stated now, which is that in terms of the economy, it is important to keep it open, especially in terms of the job market, you know, reduce the levels of discrimination where there's a sense of flexibility, mobility within the economy. And like you said, that leads to increasing mm -hmm. the size of the pie. Uh, but obviously, at the broadest level, it's also not so much about the differential between interreligious uh, population growth rates as much as it is about, again, just the openness and the overall picture of where is the total fertility rate today and what should India be doing to ensure that it's the population story and the economic story stay in balance. So anyway, thank you so much, uh, Professor Desai, for taking the time. And uh, we look forward to having you back again, maybe when we resume this conversation later on. But it was really insightful. And thank you for sharing your thoughts and ideas on this very important question of population growth. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation.